Welcome to Mad Labs, the science show that measures hairy men's fingers and takes blood from young lovers. Coming up, how to turn your urine into wine. Ah! Develop a totally new way of moving around and make the perfect sandcastle. But first, it's that loving feeling. Mad Labs has come to Pisa in search of... You've guessed it, love. Ah, love. It lifts us up where we belong. <laughs> it turns up the volume of life and makes everything beautiful. Things that you would otherwise view as being completely irrational and crazy, you think make perfect sense, even if you're not lucid at all. We all know that love makes us do some odd things. But until neuroscientist Donatella Marazziti from the University of Pisa came along, no one knew why wrapping your arms round the greatest thing in the world made otherwise rational people do the craziest of things. And where did she look for the science of love? Where else but deep in the arms of lovers themselves? When you are in love, uh, there are different uh, hormonal changes. That's right, all that crazy behaviour, that kissing, cuddling, giggly stuff that makes love lovely can be explained by the changes in just a few chemicals. Are you involved in a love relationship? Yes. Qualcuno? Si. To arrive at this rather miserable reduction of life's greatest state, Donatella compared the blood hormone levels of three groups of students for her studies. One, a bunch of singletons, another group who'd been together in a relationship for over two years, and a final group who were the newly in love group, and that's the crazy bunch she was most interested in. Everything's brighter, everything's bigger. You're, it, it just like turns up the volume and the, and the vibrance on life. <laughs> because everything's so much better. <laughs> oh, Donatella's love group were in the early phases of their relationship, a time when we are preoccupied with our lovers to the exclusion of all else. When I really fall in love with someone at the very beginning, I, I ignore everything else. You can't stop thinking about him, even, like, I guess waiting around for phone calls is the worst part of it. I just sat by the phone every day. You are only interested in the part and how to meet him, him or her, uh, how to dress for him or her. Uh, so there is an increase in what we call grooming activities. Like, you want to look your absolute very best when you see somebody, because, I mean, you know, you want them to be absolutely crazy about you, like you are about them, and you want to look your best. So what are the chemicals whizzing around the grey matter that makes a greasy smear on the cheeks so fantastic? When Donatella looked at the blood from her love group and compared it to the singletons and those jaded souls in long-term relationships, she found that her lovers had much higher levels of the hormone cortisol. Oddly, this chemical is a stress hormone designed to make us nervous, which might explain that she loves me, she loves me not syndrome that so many lovers sweat about. A second brain chemical that went out of whack in the love group was serotonin. The most uh, exciting finding of our study uh, was that we found that uh, romantic love in the early phase of the relationships present a decreased level of the serotonin system. Serotonin is, in part, a mood-altering chemical, and the levels Donatella found in her love subjects were so low that if they weren't diagnosed as lovers, they'd be diagnosed as suffering from obsessive-compulsive disorder. But there's another shocker mm. on the way. Men become in some way more similar to women, and women become in some way more similar to men. And that's all down to testosterone, the hormone that makes men men. Fall in love, boys, and the chemical that gives you your manhood drops away, explaining that sudden interest in female pursuits, like staring lovingly into another's eyes. 
Women, however, experience a boost in testosterone, which, luckily, does not make them instantly bearded, but does make them want to do things in bushes that we can't show on television. <laughs> Don't try this at home! In a moment, we'll find out why these girls have abnormally long ring fingers. But first, some vintage fun in the test department. Toby is five days into an experiment to monitor every aspect of his health, which was great until he started it. However, since that day, it's deteriorated fast. Today, he's convinced he's got swollen lymph nodes, a definite sign of dengue fever. But on double-checking in the learned journals, he realises that that slightly stiff neck could be a symptom of meningitis instead. Luckily, his temperature is normal, but those sweats, could he be having a heart attack? But then perhaps that cramping pain could be a symptom of type 1 diabetes. And with that latest worry, Toby decides a quick urine test is in order. Huh? Blood in the urine. It can only mean... Well, at least 85 conditions, some of them quite nasty. But let's check back through Toby's day to see if we can find the possible cause. <laughs> Ah, beetroot. It seems that Toby could be one of 14% of the population who are beetruic. When most people eat beetroot, the substance that makes it red, betanin, is destroyed in the stomach. But if scientists are right, the presence of oxalic acid in Toby's stomach means that the betanin survives to get absorbed by the colon and ultimately dissolved in the urine. The result is an impressive colour. Very like red wine. Which gives Toby the idea of a rather mean joke. Coming up on Mad Labs, the boffins from Cornell University who think they've discovered a new way of... Walking. Running. It's like running. It's like walking. But first, we go in search of some man digits. <laughs> Meet Dr Mark Brosnan, a psychologist at the University of Bath. He's not exactly God's gift to rugby. In fact, he's far more happy lurking in libraries. You could have worked that out for yourself if you'd had a chance to look at his hands. The ratio of the ring finger to the index finger can potentially tell a great deal about somebody. That's right. Study someone's fingers and you can tell how much of the hormone testosterone they were exposed to when they were in their mother's womb. Testosterone is the hormone that makes men... big... hairy... and square-jawed. But that's not testosterone's only effect. Mm. Exposure to prenatal testosterone is argued to influence the structure of the brain as it's developing within the womb. And that structure of the brain then goes on to uh, inform how we learn and develop in childhood in combination with other factors. But it's provided the building block for what's going on to form the adult brain, ultimately. Testosterone is funny stuff. Not only does a good slug of it in the womb result in the fetus developing what some would call a male brain, but they'll also end up with a ring finger longer than their index finger. Because women in general receive less prenatal testosterone in the womb, they tend to end up with ring and index fingers that are pretty similar in length. And a brain that is less interested in cars and football. Men, on the other hand, tend to have a small difference in the length of the two digits. The bigger hit you got in the womb, and the bigger the difference. It may also be that you'll have developed a brain that is more interested in blokey-type things. By now, you're probably looking at your own index fingers and wondering how blokey you are. But look carefully. The average difference between the ring and index finger for a man is only 2%, hence the calipers. And don't worry, ladies. 
If you find you have a longer ring than index finger, you can still wear a dress. It doesn't mean you're a man. It only means that, like the test department's Melanie here, you may have more of an interest in explosions and other things that men find fascinating. And that's what got Dr Brosnan thinking. It's often assumed that engineering and physics require a strongly male brain. And if that was the case, you'd expect people working in these sciences to have longer ring fingers than those working in the more, shall we say, effeminate disciplines like the social sciences. To see if this theory held any water, Dr Brosnan measured the fingers of both sides of the academic divide. 100 digits later, he had an answer, but not the one he expected. There were some unexpected findings in that the, the hard sciences, the physicists and the chemists, actually had a digit ratio and the finger length pattern that was typical of females, in that their finger length, their, their testosterone finger and their oestrogen finger, looked to be of a similar length, which counteracted the original arguments that uh, scientists would be extremely male thinking, would have extremely long fourth fingers. Whereas my research was contradicting that and saying, actually, a great deal of scientists have got very long index fingers, uh, more typical of the female profile. This was rather embarrassing for the idea that a long ring finger was an indication of a male-type brain. So Mad Labs decided to commission Dr Brosnan to measure the fingers of these aggressive little creatures, the University of Bath's women's rugby team. Here, there was no problem. Each and every one had a ring finger that towered over their stumpy little index digits. Four. Okay, that's the premiership finger. See? <coughs> does that mean you're a man? Premiership wife. Does that mean you're a man? It's not me here a man. It does not. I could be a premiership wife. <laughs> and indeed, she is conclusive proof that testosterone can give you a male brain, a male finger, but not necessarily a male body. <laughs> Still to come on Mad Labs, Billy Bunter plays with nettles. And we learn the science of sandcastle building. But first, what not to do at the dinner table. Anu is meant to be cooking lunch at the test department, but is more interested in demonstrating the strange characteristics of custard, a liquid that behaves like a solid. Don't believe me? Well, let's watch him play. After a brief whisk of the cheap powder variety, it's time to test its liquid properties. And I think we can say that custard is quite definitely a liquid. But what happens when you try and turn it into a ball? Suddenly, it turns into a solid. What's happening? Well, it's all got to do with these little fellows, starch molecules. So long as the custard is just pouring out slowly, the starch molecules will slip along quite nicely okay. in a liquid kind of way. But make the custard move too fast, and the starch molecules get tangled up with one another, whereupon the custard turns into a solid. As soon as the custard slows down again, the starch molecules untangle and the custard behaves like a liquid once more. So next time someone tells you not to hit your dinner with a hammer, just smile and tell them it's an experiment in molecular physics. Before we end, Mad Labs will be doing strange things with pickled onions and attempting to build the ultimate sandcastle. But first... Mad Labs has come to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, in search of these two chaps, Minoy Srinivasan and Andy Ruina, authors of a seminal work in nature on the most efficient ways of moving from A to B on two legs. Just ridiculous and sounds silly, but it showed that uh, the least tiring way to get from one place to another if you're going slowly is to walk. And the more tiring way is to run. Also laughingly obvious, you might say. But when they started analysing their findings in a computer model of the human gait, they made a rather interesting discovery. 
Their models suggested that there was another gate that was more energy efficient and